The Tudor period was a strange one. In some ways, life got a bit better for people. England under the Tudors was a little bit more peaceful than before. At the beginning of the era, 90% of people still lived in small villages and made their living from farming. But that would soon change as common lands shifted to private property and people began flocking to industrial hubs like Bristol, Liverpool, and London. More urbanization meant more disease, feces in the streets, new weird laws, and crazy kings and queens that were dead set on getting their way. Here are some of the reasons you wouldn't survive life in Tudor England. Henry VIII was very particular. Blind dates can be tough, dating apps can be tough. There could be a lot of pressure to live up to the images we post on social media. Back in Tudor times, their version of social media was, well, a painted portrait. Imagine setting your friend up on a date based on a picture of someone, in this case a nice oil painting, but he ends up disliking her so much that he has you beheaded. That's what happened between Henry VIII and Thomas Cromwell. By the time Henry VIII, third wife Jane Seymour, died in childbirth, Cromwell had risen from a lowly son of a blacksmith to Henry VIII's chief minister and one of the most powerful men in the country. With great power comes great responsibility. And Cromwell, well, he was tasked with finding Henry the Particular a new wife. In 1539, Cromwell arranged a marriage between Henry and Anne of Cleves, a German princess from the Duchy of Cleves. The marriage was mainly a political one. Cromwell figured an alliance with the Protestant states in Germany could counterbalance the growing power of the Catholic Habsburg dynasty. And there was a whole Catholic versus Protestant tension brewing that we'll get into later. Cromwell had relied on the portraits of Anne of Cleves painted by Henry VIII's court painter. But when Anne arrived in England, Henry was less than pleased with how she looked in person compared to her portraits. The king complained that Anne looked nothing like the portrait and that she was not to his liking, stating that he saw, quote, nothing in this woman as men reported of her. Henry, who was notorious for his many marriages and his pursuit of beautiful women, became disillusioned with Anne and refused to consummate the marriage, although there are reports that Anne wasn't actually that much different than her portrait. And instead, Henry was impotent and basically unable to perform in the bedroom. In any event, Henry began to blame Cromwell for arranging the marriage and accused him of deceiving him by showing him a portrait of Anne that didn't actually represent her appearance. Cromwell's fall from power began shortly after the marriage, and he was eventually accused of treason and heresy. He was executed on July 28, 1540, and it didn't go well. Some say Cromwell's enemies bribed the executioner so he'd screw the whole thing up, but there's not a whole lot of evidence to either confirm or deny this. There are also varying reports about the swiftness or ferocity of the beheading. Some say his head was lopped off in one quick blow. Others say it took a few swings. And what about the portrait painter, Hans Holbein the Younger? Well, Henry had him drown in a vat of his own oil paints. No, 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 just kidding. The portrait painter luckily made it out of the situation unscathed, which maybe points to the fact that Henry was just using a portrait as an excuse for his own impotence, or a way to get rid of his formerly most trusted advisor due to political pressures. Cromwell was a staunch Protestant, and a lot of people in Henry's court didn't like that. Thought Crimes Over the years, Henry VIII might have liked executing people more than he liked eating food. His penchant for beheadings was turned into overdrive by something called the 1534 Treason Act. It basically turned Tudor England into a kind of Orwellian dystopia, with thought crimes being handed out almost arbitrarily. Let's get into how that happened. After Henry split from Rome and established the Church of England, it was mainly because he wanted a divorce, which was impossible in Catholicism, so he made himself the head of the English Church a move that was intended to consolidate his power and assert his authority over religious matters. This break with Rome was driven by a combination of personal, political, and religious factors, including his desire for male heir, his grievances with the Pope, and his growing interest in Protestant ideas. Now, to cement his position as the head of the English Church, Henry passed the 1534 Treason Act, which made it a crime punishable by death to deny that Henry was the head of the Church, to wish harm to the king or queen or to suggest that he was either a heretic or a tyrant. This act was intended to suppress dissent and ensure loyalty to the king, and it had a chilling effect on public discourse in England. 
People now had to be very careful about what they said or wrote about the king in public for fear of being accused of treason and facing severe consequences. So be honest, do you think you could hold in all the awful things you'd like to say about Henry? The Treason Act also served as a tool for Henry to eliminate potential threats to his rule. Anyone who opposed him or his policies could be accused of treason and swiftly punished. The following is a kind of greatest hits of notable people Henry had taken out. First up, we have Sir Thomas More. More was a prominent lawyer, a writer, a politician, who served as Lord Chancellor of England. More refused to acknowledge Henry as the head of the church and opposed the king's annulment of his marriage to Catherine of Aragon. He was charged with high treason and beheaded in 1535. Next up, John Fisher. Fisher was the Bishop of Rochester and a leading Catholic theologian. Fisher was a vocal opponent of Henry's break with Rome and refused to acknowledge him as the head of the Church of England. He was charged with high treason and beheaded in 1535, right alongside Thomas More. Then we have Thomas Seymour. Seymour was the brother of Jane Seymour and uncle of King Edward VI. He was executed in 1549 for treason and attempting to marry Elizabeth, the future Queen Elizabeth I, without permission. We can go on and on, but let's end with one more. We can't forget Anne Boleyn. Henry's second wife was charged with adultery, interbreeding, and treason in 1536 and was executed under the Treason Act. The charges were likely fabricated by Henry, who was looking for a way to end his marriage to Anne and marry Jane Seymour. Hundreds more people, many of them highly influential, were executed or jailed as a result of Henry's paranoia and overall insistence that he was the supreme power, head of the church, and basically the one with God's ear. Weird Ways to Go Tudor England was a time of pretty intense social and economic change. Like we said at the top, more and more people were moving from the countryside to the city, and as a result, there were all kinds of new environments with new technologies that might seem mundane today. But back then, people were still trying to figure them out, and oftentimes pretty unsuccessfully. For example, ratsbane, also known as arsenic, was a common poison used in Tudor England for a variety of purposes, from obviously a rat poison, to a way for one human to get rid of another human he didn't like, to a medicine, and something we'll get into a bit later. Arsenic was readily available in many forms, and was often used by people to poison rats and other vermin in their homes and businesses. Again, as more people flocked to cities, there were inevitably more rats, and rat's bane became as common a household staple as tea or flour. And sure enough, people would mix them up with fatal consequences. In one case, a housewife in Leicestershire named Barbara Gilbert thought she was adding flour to a meal she was making for her family. But whoops, it was rat's bane. When she tested out her meal, she ended up fatally poisoning herself. It's a theme that seems to pop up again and again in Tudor England, people inadvertently mixing up a deadly poison for edible kitchen ingredients. There's a story about another woman who got up in the middle of the night to get some beer for her sick husband because, yes, beer was often more sanitary than water back then, but instead of beer, she picked up some rat's bane and water. Let's just say her husband didn't get better. But oftentimes, rat's bane was accidentally confused with something else. It was used on purpose to take someone's life. This happened to the unfortunate Sir Thomas Overbury, a writer and courtier who died in 1613 while he was imprisoned in the Tower of London. Technically, Overbury's death occurred a few years after the Tudor period, but the story starts during it, so let's not go crazy in the comments, all right? Overbury had been a close friend of a guy named Robert Carr, who was a favorite of King James I when he came to power in 1603, but things turned sour and Overbury was in prison on trumped-up charges after expressing his displeasure with a marriage proposal between Carr and a countess named Frances Howard. Yes, that could land you in prison. While in prison, Overbury was allegedly poisoned with arsenic by Countess Howard, who was afraid that Overbury would expose some of her dirty laundry, which included some scandalous affairs and ruin her marriage. Overbury's death was initially attributed to natural causes, but after finding that his body was covered in black spots and his organs were basically putrefied, people wised up to the fact that there was something nefarious going on. There was an investigation, and it was discovered that arsenic had been added to his food and drink. A few of his jailers and some of their associates ended up getting arrested and executed for their role in the plot. Howard avoided any punishment. It pays to be a countess. Death by bacon, anyone? The practice of smoking meat was common in Tudor times, and it wasn't unusual for big slabs of bacon called flitches to be hung in the chimney to dry and smoke. Even this could be dangerous, though. 
as the unfortunate story of Elizabeth Brown will demonstrate. Brown was working as a servant in the household of a wealthy nobleman when she had a deadly accident. Apparently, the rope holding the bacon in the chimney broke, which caused the heavy flitches to fall and crush her as she warmed herself by the fire. The injuries Brown sustained were severe, and despite the efforts of the household to provide medical treatment, she died four days later. You know what else was just getting going during Tudor times? Clocks. And believe it or not, just like bacon, they could be deadly too. Well, working on them could be deadly. Clock towers were just starting to become a thing, and like anything new, there were some kinks in figuring out how to repair them properly. One unfortunate incident occurred in 1513 in the town of Bungay, Suffolk, England. A laborer named John Townsend was working on repairing the large clock mechanism on the town's church tower. One day, he was carrying the mechanism down from the tower when it slipped from his hands and fell to the ground. Well, not to the ground. It landed on the head of a young kid named William Brett and then to the ground. Despite the efforts of local doctors and surgeons, William Brett died the following day from his injuries. The incident caused a great deal of shock and sadness in the town, and it was seen as a tragic accident that could have been avoided with more caution and more care. The accident in Bungate wasn't an isolated incident during Tudor England. As clockmaking became more common and clocks were installed in public places, accidents involving falling clock weights or other clock parts became more frequent. Henry VIII's Madness You'd want to watch your back if you were in Henry VIII's court during his reign. We've just described the wrath he brought down on Thomas Cromwell for what he perceived to be a deceptive portrait. But there's a whole list of other advisors and nobles, politicians, and clergy who also felt Henry's wrath over the years. To explain why Henry VIII enjoyed lopping people's heads off so much, it would help to get into his mind, and to get into his mind, it'll help to explain his health situation. Henry was a pretty fit young man in his prime, but that gradually changed over the course of his life. Henry liked to joust, and he liked to joust maybe a bit too much. He got quite more than a few jousting injuries during his life, and that left him with chronic pain and mobility issues. One in particular was a leg wound he acquired in 1536 that never fully healed, and which likely contributed to the development of an ulcer. This wound and ulcer apparently caused him quite a bit of pain and discomfort, and he was often unable to walk or stand for long periods of time. Henry, like a lot of us, also packed on the pounds over the years and ended up severely overweight. Some accounts say he weighed around 400 pounds toward the end of his life. His lavish lifestyle, which included sumptuous tables full of food, combined with his inability to move around very well, most likely caused the weight gain. His obesity then contributed to all kinds of other health problems, including heart disease, hypertension, and diabetes. Henry was also believed to have suffered from a range of mental health issues, including, but not limited to, depression, anxiety, and paranoia. Some historians have, understandably, connected his mental health problems to the physical problems he suffered from over the course of his life. So, we have a paranoid, overweight, depressed, physically disabled king who, in addition to all that, is on some kind of sick crusade to have a male heir and willing to literally change his kingdom's religion to make sure he can marry whoever he wants in order to make that happen. It wasn't a good recipe for a stable rule or a good sign for those in the court of Henry VIII. Curious Medicine We've already mentioned how arsenic, aka ratsbane, was often accidentally ingested or intentionally fed to people during the Tudor period. But the stuff that was used to kill rats and pesky noblemen was also used as a medicine. Medicinal arsenic, as strange as that term sounds, was used during Tudor times in a variety of forms. It came as a topical treatment, as an oral medication, and as a cosmetic. Many women use arsenic-based products to whiten their skin and create a pale complexion. That was like in vogue back at that time. Queen Elizabeth I reportedly loved the stuff, and there's even a theory that she died from blood poisoning from the years of caking all that arsenic-laced makeup on her face. Arsenic was often used as a treatment for skin conditions like psoriasis and eczema. It was either applied topically as a lotion or ointment, or it could be administered orally in small doses. While arsenic was believed to have anti-inflammatory properties and could reduce skin inflammation, it could also cause significant side effects, including skin irritation and even poisoning. Bloodletting was also a common medical treatment at the time, because why wouldn't having less blood make you healthier? Blood was removed from a patient in a few different ways, either by using a knife or lancet to make a small incision, or by using a cupping glass to create suction, or by letting leeches latch onto different parts of a patient's skin and do their thing. 
Bloodletting was thought to help balance the body's humors. And by humors, I don't mean a sense of humor. The concept of humors goes back to the ancient Greeks, who thought the body was made up of four fluids called humors – blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. Someone was in good health when these four humors were in balance. During the Tudor era, the concept of humors became even more prominent and it was widely adopted by physicians and other medical practitioners. They believed that various factors like diet, lifestyle, and climate could affect the balance of humors in the body and lead to illness. For example, eating too much meat could increase the amount of hot or choleric yellow bile in the body, leading to fever and inflammation. That was great news for Tudor-era vegetarians. But unfortunately, thinking of health in terms of humors and then sucking blood from people often just made their condition worse and led to more dangerous and deadly infections and complications. Bloody Mary Speaking of bloodletting, Bloody Mary. Way before bartenders started mixing vodka and tomato juice and serving it to brunch goers, there was Queen Mary I. Bloody Mary was the daughter of Henry VIII and his wife, his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, and she might have liked executing people even more than her father did. The reasons behind it were religious. Mary was a devout Catholic, and in her brief reign, which lasted just five years from 1553 to 1558, she did her best to reverse the policies of her father, which saw Catholicism sidelined for Protestantism and the Church of England. She repealed many of the Protestant-friendly laws that had been passed by her half-brother, Edward VI, during his brief reign, and replaced them with laws that supported Catholicism. She also brought in Spanish advisors who were staunchly Catholic and who encouraged her in her persecution of Protestants. Mary's persecution of Protestants began in earnest in 1554 with the passing of the Heresy Acts, which made it illegal to question Catholic doctrine. Particularly anyone who denied the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, where bread and wine literally became the body and blood of Jesus. Lots of Protestants didn't want to eat and drink Jesus, and it led to the arrest of a lot of them who were then given the choice of converting to Catholicism or being burned alive. The most famous case of the persecution of Protestants under Mary was that of the Oxford Martyrs, which involved three Protestant bishops, Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Ridley, and Thomas Cranmer. They were charged with heresy and burned at the stake in Oxford in 1555. The executions of these high-profile bishops were meant to send a message to other Protestants that their beliefs wouldn't be tolerated and England would once again become a Catholic country. In total, hundreds of Protestants were executed during Mary's reign, with estimates ranging from 280 to over 600 people. A lot of them were burned at the stake, while others were sent to the gallows or beheaded. Many more were imprisoned or forced to flee the country. And the Protestant persecution under Mary wasn't just limited to England. In Ireland, the Catholic Archbishop of Dublin, George Brown, oversaw the burning of Protestants in Dublin and other parts of the country. Mary's Protestant burning spree wasn't exactly loved by a lot of people in England, and there was widespread unrest and protest during this time. However, she died of what many believe was uterine cancer before any major coup could take place. When her half-sister, Elizabeth I, a Protestant, succeeded her, she reversed pretty much all of Mary's laws concerning religion and made Protestantism the official religion again instead of Catholicism. The Priest Hunter Things took a turn in the opposite direction during Elizabeth I's reign. The seesaw between the persecution of Protestants and Catholics would continue, and now would be the Catholics' turn to see the business end of an executioner's axe. One of the most notorious anti-Catholic zealots during this time was a guy known as the Priest Hunter. His Catholic God-given name was Richard Topcliffe. Topcliffe was a member of Parliament and held various positions in the government over the years, including serving as a Justice of the Peace and something called a Presuviant, which was kind of a government agent who was tasked with apprehending religious dissidents. He was known for his extreme cruelty and his willingness to use torture to extract information from those unfortunate enough to draw his ires. During Elizabeth's reign, Topcliffe became known for his ruthless pursuit of Catholic priests, whom he saw as a threat to the stability of the state. He would use a variety of methods to try and get information from them, including the infamous Topcliffe's persuasion, which involved suspending a prisoner from the ceiling and then dropping them repeatedly until they agreed to talk. After he'd forced a confession from a Catholic priest or some other non-Catholic scapegoat, Topcliffe would usually attend their trial and see them condemned to death. He would then personally attend the execution and make sure that the full punishment was carried out. For those who were convicted of treason, the punishment was particularly brutal. They would be sent to the gallows, but not to the point of unconsciousness, 
then punctured and quartered while still alive. Topcliffe also took a lot of pleasure in humiliating his prisoners before their executions. He would taunt them and insult them, often in public, and he was known to force them to kneel before him and kiss his hand. What a guy. Topcliffe also had a network of spies who would report on the activities of suspected Catholics, and he wasn't above using blackmail and other underhanded tactics to achieve what he wanted. He was responsible for the arrest and execution of dozens of Catholic priests and other religious figures, including the Jesuit priest Edmund Campion, who was tortured and executed in 1581. Tudor Witch Trials The Tudor era also coincided with what can only be described as witch mania. Catholicism might have been taboo at certain points and Protestantism at others, but pretty much everyone at the time could agree, albeit crazily, that witches were bad news. During the Tudor period, thousands of women were accused and executed for practicing witchcraft. These witch hunts were driven by fear and superstition, and a lot of the trials had some pretty bizarre accusations that were the result of a mass hysteria that was sweeping the island and which eventually bled over into the colonies in the form of the Salem Witch Trials, among others. One of the weirdest was the Witches of Warboys trial. The trial took place in Huntingdonshire in England in 1593 and involved four women from the village of Warboys who were accused of practicing witchcraft and engaging in ungodly supernatural acts. The accusations against the women were incredibly bizarre and included claims that they flew on broomsticks and casted spells on local livestock. The main accusers in the trial were two young girls, Jane Willis and Susan Lathrop, who claimed to have been bewitched by the women. They accused the women of giving them hallucinations and seizure-type fits. The girls also claimed that the witches had the ability to transform into animals like dogs and cats and stuff like that. Despite the wild accusations, the women were found guilty and sentenced to death. Their trial and execution were big news in Tudor England, and they were held up as examples of the dangers of witchcraft and the need for vigilance against supernatural threats. Then there were the North Berwick Witch Trials, which took place up north in Scotland between 1589 and 1591. A group of women were accused of plotting to kill King James VI of Scotland through witchcraft. The trial was very heavily influenced by the king, who was personally involved in the investigation and prosecution of the so-called witches. The trial resulted in the execution of more than 70 people. One of the factors that contributed to the whole witch hunt hysteria was actually the pretty drastic social and economic changes that were going on at the time. Monasteries were closing, common land once used for farming was being turned to private land, capitalism was developing, people were moving from farms to cities. It was creating a lot of upheaval and many people found themselves struggling to make a living. A lot of people needed a scapegoat and witches were it. What else do you want to know about Tudor England? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.